Welcome. My name is Philip Levine. I am the president and owner of Southflower Web Advisors, and it is my pleasure to present to you managing and supporting 450 plus websites a solopreneur's journey. So let's dive right into this. Just before actually I get started, how many people in this room manage one WordPress website? <laughs> how many manage five? How many manage 10? How many manage more than 25? Okay. So, a couple things I'm going to cover today. Give you a little bit about me, just my own background, my journey. What are the tools that I use? Um, how do I use them? If you were here for Chris's talk that just finished or Nathan's earlier, I actually, a lot of the things that they talk about, I apply in my own business. So I was really excited to sit through them and say, hey, yeah, I'm doing that already. How I've grown the business, how I've been able to bring on all these clients, and lessons that I've learned. Finally, I'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end. So, I like to have my presentations have a little bit about me with my photos of the family and so forth. As Chris was saying, um, I started out in 1997 with website development. I started out with a notepad editor and front page. Um, my first two websites were my high school website and a, a state representative in the state uh, House of Delegates. And actually, I'm still doing her website to this day. We've gone through a number of iterations over the years, but I'm still doing her website to this day. And I've always had a passion for this. I've always liked technology, and so that's where I started out. After high school, I went to Rochester Institute of Technology and got a degree in management information systems. Um, I also got a certificate in what they called e-business, which was in essence online marketing and e-commerce. And again, I'm one of those people who I'm doing what I went to school for. I know we, we hear about people going in all different directions. After school, I joined a small, what I would consider a startup company. It was a company of about uh, seven people that did a, um, they had a content management system. At the time, it, I remember a conversation sitting around saying, well, wait, WordPress does this. Don't we want to do that as well? And it was like, well, yeah, it's PHP-based, but no, we want to go in a different direction with certain things. And in that company, I did everything from customer support to billing to uh, sales engineering and everything in between. So I learned a lot about business operations just in that small company. Around 2010, I had been there for almost seven years at that point, and we just heard about customer support in the last session in here, and I saw the direction customer support was going, I saw the direction the company was going, and I said, this is not where I want to go with my career, where I, what I want to be doing, and so I ended up leaving and going to work with one of their distributors who was really focusing on websites in the local community. And one of the things that I found was because I left of my own accord, I left on really good terms, I still keep in contact with the people, both the ownership, employees, as well as some of the clients who have reached out to me over the years. And so it was one of the lessons that I learned early on is don't burn bridges. Even if you're, you know, depending on where things are going, just be personable, be good about it, and you never know where it's going to lead down the line. So I joined one of the... Uh, local agencies. It was him, he had a, a partner, it was myself. His partner left and so it was just him and me then. And after about three years, he decided he was ready to retire. Um, and mind you, this was his third time over retiring. Um, I, in essence, purchased out the business from him. And at that point, we had about six, 60 websites and most of them were HTML just static sites that were literally, if we made one update to them a year, that was it. Um, and we had about five or 10 WordPress websites. And so that was really where I started my baseline of the company. So who do I manage and support? Directly, I have about 150 direct clients today. And these are nonprofits, these are doctor's offices, some law firms, you name it, I work with them. I have a number of homeowners associations. And then I have over 300 what I call agency client sites. So I work with three or four different agencies depending on the, the day of the week. Um, 
And I am, in essence, their tier two support. So I am doing everything that we've all talked about that we do with WordPress. I work, I do that for them. I work behind the scenes so that way when their clients have an issue and they can't figure it out, they reach out to me. I'm sort of like a virtual employee from that perspective. And I make sure that their WordPress websites are up and running and stay secure. So for my direct clients, first thing that I do is I take care of their content, I take care of their plugins, and I take care of their system updates. And when I say content, I'm not generating content for them. They provide me the content, but they don't have to worry about logging into WordPress. Um, I was actually looking through, and I would say probably about 90% of the 150 websites, my clients don't even have an admin login. They, they just So I don't worry about them messing things up from that perspective. They just send me their content, and that's included in the service that I'm providing. And many of these clients are clients, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that only have a few updates a year. They're changing out an event, or they want to change a photo. Most of their sites, other than a contact form as their call to action, they want to have an online presence. They're not, they don't necessarily need to be doing other things with it. The other thing, though, that I do is consult for projects and direction. So some of the clients that I have are nonprofit associations. These are the clients that are a bit more active and that I do give that are logging into WordPress. For these clients, usually once a quarter, we will sit down for about an hour and say, what's coming up in the next quarter? What are the projects that we need to be working on? Is there anything that they need that is not already being done that might be a custom project for me? Or is it just the day-to-day -day operations, but at least we know what's going on with their website? What I really have fun with these is some of the consultative pieces of it is where they say, oh, well, we need to do X, Y, Z for a project. And sometimes I can say, great, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I've already done this three other times, and let me just copy it in. And other times it's like, wow, I've never really thought about that. Let me do some research and I can get back with you if we can, if we need to bring in a third party. And I'm very upfront with them. I know what my limitations are. I don't try to oversell myself. And I'll say, I need to do some research on that and get back to you and let you know if I can do that or not. And my clients, I find, appreciate that honesty because if it is something that I have to bill them for or if we do need to go to a third party, they are very comfortable with that decision at that point. Now, for the agencies that I work with, the first thing is I'm their tier two support. I don't often directly interact with their customers. Sometimes I will when we get into some sales engineering, but for the most part, I'm just in the background, but it gives them that level of comfort that they can maintain the content. They do a lot of SEO work. They do a lot of optimization and lead management. And so they can focus on that. And I focus on the stuff that they don't want to have to think about, which is the technical things. One of the agencies that I work with, I, I love, I'm on a Zoom call with them every so often, and they, they say, oh my God, Philip, you just put me into a coma because they just don't get the technology, and that's fine. They don't need to. They are very good at the marketing and organization management, which is the services that they provide, and so I help them out, and I'm there as a resource for them. I also take care of doing their plugin and system updates. Um, one of the things that was talked about, and I think it was actually in one of the sessions yesterday about onboarding a client is making sure that you get login information. And so even for these agencies, whether it's through delegated access to their account or if they share passwords through a password manager, I make sure I get their logins as well because just God forbid you run a plugin update, something fails along the way, I need to be able to go in and fix it and I don't want to have to first call them or call their client to get access. It's Great one, I can just get in FTP, whatever it is, and make the update and get it fixed. And usually nobody's the wiser. I'll let them know that something happened, but I'm able to take care of that. And finally, like with my direct clients, I often do the sales engineering side of things and co consultation. And oftentimes, these are bigger projects that we need to do. And again, they'll bring me in as needed on those. So. Now that I said, well, who am I supporting? Well, how have I grown the business and where do I get my leads from? So the first thing that I've always been involved with is networking groups. And these in turn are oftentimes through Chamber of Commerces. I have found that these are one of the best sources of leads because they're often pre-qualified. It's not just somebody saying, oh, here, here's somebody, you know, go sell them a website. It's, 
oh, this is one of my existing clients. They have this need. Please, can you help them out? And so it's really about relationships. Um, the networking groups I've found over the years, especially when you can get a what's called a power team or a core group. So if I can find one that has an IT person who doesn't do websites but does all the hardware side of things that I don't want to touch, or that also has like a graphic artist or a print shop where the website is not their area of expertise, but they love giving out referrals so that way they're servicing the need of their clients. One of my biggest lead sources that I have. Next thing is current customers. I find that I would say probably 90% of my leads come from current customers because I make them happy. They let their friends and family and other business acquaintances know and that's where they then refer to me. I would say probably about 90% of the leads and business that I get is almost sold before I even speak to the customer. It's more so they just want some of the details of what I'm offering. And I'm very transparent with my pricing up front. It's I, I'll say, this is, you know, here is our ballpark number for what this is gonna be. Does this sound like what you're looking for? And I've had some clients be like, oh wait, no, that, that's a little bit more. I'm not ready to go that route. Or some being will say, wait, that's all that it is? And, and I often laugh and I say, yes, because of how I've structured the business, I'm able to scale and do it at that price point. Next thing is conferences and message boards. So I attend word camps, I attend some other meetups as well. And I find it's great not only to attend the conference and learn new things, but also to network with people, to find others that are doing similar things, some that might need various services. And then the message boards I find are a way for me to give back. I'm very active in a number of online groups on Facebook and, and with some of the hosting companies as well. And I really try to give back because I've been doing this for over 20 years now and I have a vast amount of knowledge and I want to help those that are just learning or might be looking at new ways of doing things. And so I really try to give back. And oftentimes what will happen is somebody will say, oh, I saw your responses on the message board. Could you help me out with this? And we go from there. I will say I do try not to take on too many one-off projects. I really try to get people into a maintenance plan and recurring revenue because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. But sometimes there's the instance where it's like, no, this is really just gonna be this one-off project and I, and I will do it. But those are really few and far between because I really am about the relationships. Now, one of the last points that I have on here is strategic barters free sites. Over the years, I've probably done about one free site every three years or so. And oftentimes it's where I see that I have the opportunity to get my name out there in additional places and addition additional vertical markets, um, as well as where it's just the right thing to do. There's been some, you know, whether it be a organization that was doing good things in the community. Um, there was one is my local community newspaper for my, it's a new monthly newsletter for my community. I give them the site, they, they put an ad in there. Over the six or seven years that I've been doing the site, I don't think I've gotten one lead from it, but it's just, it's one of those things People see me, they know me, and, and actually what they've done is they sometimes have referred to, oh, I saw your ad, I let somebody else know about it, and sometimes they call. Um, so from there, what is my business model? What is my pricing? First thing is I have a one-time setup fee. This is, in essence, my onboarding fee. And I've really honed in on this, is what does it cost me in terms of my out-of-pocket expense and my time to get up and running. And that's one of the things that people often don't necessarily factor in is they think about, well, okay, I know how much the server costs, I know how much the theme costs, but they don't necessarily factor in their time cost to this. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes is know your value, know how much your time is worth. And sometimes on some of these things, I factored in a learning curve of saying, okay, once I know how to do this, I know that it'll only take me a half hour, but on this one, it's gonna take me two hours. Now, I'm not necessarily gonna charge the client for those that extra hour and a half of my learning time, but I at least know in the back of my mind where I'm gonna be with things. Now, what I will often do is on this one-time setup fee, I typically split it, half up front, half when we go live with the website. Some clients have said, oh, can you do any terms? And usually what I'll do is when I do terms, I then say, yes, but we're gonna do a set schedule because 
I want to make sure that they're not dragging their feet out on getting me my payment. The next thing is I have a monthly fee that I bill quarterly. I find doing it quarterly and in advance of the quarter. This way, if there's ever any issues, I know from a cash flow perspective, I'm always getting three months of revenue coming in and not all of my clients are on the same quarter. So every month I'm getting quarterly payments from anywhere from you know, 20, 30 clients at any given time. And so I always have that in there and it makes life a lot easier. If a client were to leave me, oftentimes it's they might leave me in the middle of the quarter, they don't even ask for anything back and it's a month to month sort of agreement. One of the things with determining and getting where my monthly fee was, is and was, is knowing what my out-of-pocket expense is. So I mentioned that I started out doing HTML websites. When we were doing the HTML websites, we were charging people $25 a month. That was for the hosting. If they had an update here or there, $25 a month. Today, I'm charging $75 a month. Now, my costs have not necessarily gone up that much, but there's value in the services that I'm offering. My, when I do my budgeting, I figure on approximately $10 to $15 per month per website. When I factor an all-in cost of how much is the hosting, how much have I paid for things like Elementor, how much have I paid for Gravity Forms, how much have I paid for all these different components, because I use them on all those sites, so I take that and divide it out, and so that way I have a real good idea of what this is actually costing me, and then I know if my monthly fee is at a good price point. One of the things that I do this is a turnkey offering, meaning that I am providing everything. I take care of their domain registration. I do register it in their name, so if they ever need, when I transfer it to them, it is in their name. Um, but everything really resides in my account. My clients, for the most part, love this because they don't have to think about, well, wait, who is my server provider? Who is my domain registration? They just come to me for all of that. It's a one-stop shop. It also makes me sticky, meaning that if they do want to leave, and I've made it very easy for people to leave if they ever want to, but at the same time, it's like, wait, they have everything with me. They don't necessarily want to have to go get a new vendor for everything, so it makes me a little more sticky. The other thing that I've done is had a standard setup and environment. I have a standard load set. Um, I actually don't do it as a clone. I do it as a new install each time, although it probably takes me maybe 10 minutes longer. I find this way I know that I have the latest plug-in versions and that I'm not working off an old clone and I know everything is clean. My next thing is managing my time. And I loved in uh, Chris's presentation for those that were in the room where he talked about setting boundaries. Um, one of the things is I really try to keep to a 40 hour work week. And as I say this, and as I was rehearsing this, my wife was yelling at me and, and rolling her eyes at me of, wait, do you really do a 40 hour work week? No, it's probably more like 50 to 60, depending on what's going on. But I do try to keep to the 40 hours because it, it makes, it sets those boundaries. And even if I, like I had an email that came in a little while ago and I replied to the client saying, thank you, I got this. I know what the issue is. It will be addressed during the week. I at least acknowledged it, but that was it. It wasn't that I was addressing the issue then and there. I just wanted them to at least know that I acknowledged it. So first thing is I take about 10% of my time to work on new websites, doing the networking, doing um, just being out there in the community. 10% of my time spent on that. Then I take about 10% of my time going on to Facebook and doing more of my give back sort of thing. And again, I look at that from the perspective of it does help me grow the business over time. It, I build my reputation. And so I, there is value in doing that. About 5% of my time is bookkeeping and accounting. I use QuickBooks for my accounting. I have memorized transactions. So it really is just doing some of the day-to-day -day cleanup of deposits and just making sure where everything is at with receivables, but it doesn't take a lot of my time because I've automated that. 10% of my time is spent on the consulting side of it, of saying, well, what projects are you doing? What, what's new? Where do you want to go with this? 25% of my time is on the maintenance work of doing backups, doing plug-in updates, and while I am using 
some site management tools. I don't have the automation turned on. This is one thing that I often tell people, and some people will disagree with me on this, but I, I do not, with the exception I think of Gravity Forms, have any automated plugin updates turned on. I want to know when those updates are going to run because, again, you never know, even though if you have backups, you never know if something could break somewhere, and I'd rather know I'm clicking update, so if I know that something's broken, okay, I can go and address it because I just went in and clicked update. I will update 100 plus websites at one time, but I do it when I know that I'm gonna do it. And then the biggest chunk of my time is really doing the content updates, is when my clients send me the updates that the support tickets aren't necessarily issues, they're updates that they need made to their website, and that is really the biggest chunk of my time. Now what I also find is that I'll have client A email me today and then I won't hear from them for eight months, Client B will email me tomorrow and so forth. So that is also the way that I'm able to scale things is I'm not necessarily handling all the same clients every month of the content updates because it just it's that moving window. So the next thing that I like to look at is what are the systems that I use? And one thing that I have up here is I say that I'm always evaluating. And what I mean by that is so for example, accounting. I use QuickBooks. About a month ago, I got an email from QuickBooks saying, with your next billing cycle, you're now gonna be another $5 more per month. And I said, okay, well, this is now $25 more than what I started using QuickBooks. What else is out there? And I spent about an hour of my time and I looked and I, there's FreshBooks, there's a few other systems, and I started looking. And they're all at the same price point. And I said, this is an instance where what I have is working, there isn't something more cost effective out there. And so it's not going to be beneficial for me to, to move. But I do look at what else is out there because I need to be aware of it. Even if it's just for my own education that I'm not going to switch, but at least knowing what else is out there. Next thing is site management. I happen to use uh, ProSites from GoDaddy, which is their managed WP product. I have been using this for, oh, probably about four years at this point, and it's probably one of the longest time that I've used any of the site management tools. Just spend a moment on this. When I first started expanding my WordPress management, I started out with, a, there was a product and still around called Infinite WP, which was great when I only had 15, 20 sites in there, but as I started to grow, at the time, their platform couldn't necessarily support in a efficient way large number of sites. You'd click on update or you just log in and it would take 25 minutes just to synchronize the dashboard. And I'm like, no, I need to be more productive than that. From there, I went to WP Remote. This was before Blog Vault acquired them. Um, worked with that for a little bit. Then I went to uh, Main WP, which if you're looking for a self-hosted solution, I, I'll tell you, I like their product. The only, the only negative that I ever can find about it is the fact that they don't do a lot directly with their product. They rely on third-party providers, and so you have to install a lot of add-ons and plugins to integrate those third-party providers, and I like to keep my WordPress sites lean where I can and not have as many plugins. That's my only knock on main WP. If, if I were to ever have to switch, I would probably go back to that. Um, and as I said, I, I ended up with uh, right around the time of GoDaddy's acquisition of Manage WP when they were launching their Orion product, I went to Manage WP and I was like, hey, this has everything I need. It can handle backups. I don't see server performance issues. And so it worked. But again, even last night in talking with the folks from Jetpack, I looked at their dashboard overnight. It was like, okay, this is interesting. Let me just see. Because again, this way if a client asks me, well, what are you using? Or if I'm net, I can talk to it in an intelligent way. Hosting. I have used any hosting product and every hosting product across the board, whether it be cPanel. I was doing WordPress on a Windows uh, box at one point. I don't recommend that, but I was doing that. Um, I've used managed products. Today, I actually am using um, Amazon LightSales server on their AWS product. It, it is a VPS server, but one of their things, and people will say, well, wait, how, why would you ever use a product that limits CPU usage because they um, it has some virtualization on the CPU. And my sites 
most of my sites are five to 10 pages, and if they get 50 visits a week, it's a lot. They're, these are people who just want to have an online presence. What I liked about Amazon Light Sale is I start out with their $5 a month server, which is a one gig, uh, two CPU server, and my larger clients I have on their $20 a month server, which is a um, two CPU, eight gig server, and it works. I really don't have performance issues. And what I like about this is I set each client up on their own server. I actually set each client up in their own um, Amazon account. I then have consolidated billing. And this way, it really isolates that client that if I ever have any issues or if they want to move, I say to that client, guess what? You don't even need to move your hosting. You don't want to use my services. That's fine. I can just move this Amazon account over to you and you take ownership and it's good. So it it gives me a lot of flexibility from that perspective. And finally, the, the last thing that I um, use in evaluating is mail services. This is just what I inherited with the business was doing email for clients. These are basic pop IMAP accounts. We really try to keep things simple. Um, I had used the Windows-based product at one point um, about eight years ago or so. Uh, there's a small little company known as OpenSRS. For those that may not know it by that name, you might have heard of a domain company called Two Cows. OpenSRS is the, the parent company of Two Cows. They have an email hosting product that is uh, 50 cents per five gig mailbox per month, which when it comes to hosting mailboxes, that is very reasonable. Well, they've had infrastructure issues. So again, I was evaluating and I actually found a company out of uh, Las Vegas called MX Route that um, all they do is email hosting and I've been very happy with them and I've moved many of my clients over to them and used them for new, um, new clients. So what are some of the lessons that I've learned? And my house is a cat household so I had to have a cat in my presentation here. I mentioned earlier, know your own value. So, I'll sometimes have clients ask me, well, oh, it's $75 a month, what if you bill me out? I say, well, if I'm gonna bill you hourly, I'm gonna bill you at a minimum of 125 an hour. And I found over the years that for most of my clients that if I were to bill them hourly over the course of the year just for that and maybe bill them a small amount for the hosting, they'd end up paying me probably more actually if they were, it's sort of like car insurance sort of thing is you pay even if you're not necessarily gonna need it, it's there for the peace of mind. and I've found over the years it just works better and I know my value and I and if I have somebody who says oh well you know that's well I'm sorry if that's going to be too much I, I'm sorry maybe we're not going to be able to work together because this is this is the price point that I'm at today takeaway sale this is something that I learned and I've actually probably closed about five deals with this one is where while you're talking with the customer, if you see that they're sort of like on the fence, and, and you might know in, in your mind that, hey, this can be a good fit in the long run, you sort of say to them, maybe you're not ready to work with me, maybe this isn't going to be the right fit long term, why don't you, you know, work with a DIY builder or something along those lines, get started, and come back to me when you're, and they'll all of a sudden say, like, oh, wait, no, 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 I, I want to work with you, I don't want to uh, have to, I need somebody who can do this for me. Um, don't take on projects that don't fit. Learn this, in, in essence, did this one time, started the project, um, ended up giving the client the money back because it wasn't, it just, it wasn't the right fit. And at this point in my career and in where I have the business today, I don't take every project that walks in the door. I really be careful about that. And it's because you get burned once and it's like, you never want to do it again. So it's just be aware, know what your level of expertise, what you're comfortable with, and don't take on things that don't fit. Listen to others, find out synergies. Um, I often will, again, at conferences, listen to what other presenters are saying, find things of where there are systems that I may not have thought of using and be like, oh wait, that's a great way that I can grow the business. It was actually interesting, I was chatting with uh, the folks upstairs at Jetpack, and they were telling me about um, something in WooCommerce with a change to the database table structure. And I was like, oh my goodness, I never even knew about that. I didn't even know you were working on that. That will make my life so much easier when I go to migrate this new website that I, we just rebuilt and I need to move all their commerce data. If it's in separate tables, that's gonna make my life so much easier. So listen to what others are 
talking about, find those synergies. One of the biggest things, and people often say to me when I get on a Zoom call with them, they'll say, you have such a, a smile. You have, you're so positive. Life is too short to worry about so many of these things. You just got to you know, roll with it, go with it. If I lose a client, do I lose sleep over it? Maybe one night, and I sometimes go back and say, wait, why did I lose that client? But at the end of the day, it's one client. It's not, and guess what? The next day, I'm going to bring on a new client and probably have them paying more than the old client that left was paying. So in the end, it, it's a better thing to do. And I just, I love doing this. So uh, with that, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, what I would tell you the entire suite, the enti between the performance monitoring, definitely the backups, um, the SEO tool, really everything that they have in their suite. Now, I the only thing I actually don't use that is one of the paid add-ons is the client reporting. My clients, I've never sent, with the exception I think of one, never sent my clients a monthly, quarterly report because they don't, frankly, they'll tell you. They don't care. They just they want their website up and running. They want to know that I'm managing it for them, and that's where it is. Now I will say, and I I forget who said this. Um, I think it was Nathan said this this morning in his talk. Is I am very careful about presenting the company as well. Yes, they're working with me. They're working with my company, and they they know the company is just me. But it's it's not just it's selling the company because. There, from a branding perspective, it's not that I'm branding myself, I'm branding the company, and that, I have found, helps grow the business as well. I was just gonna piggyback off, but did, did you repeat her question? Yeah, sure, the, the question was, what paid add-ons do I use and recommend within Managed WP? Okay, and then I just wanted to, to follow up, because you said that they don't care, are, you're saying clients aren't asking for analytics? I install analytics. <laughs> I, I install analytics on all my sites so that way I have that information. But when 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 you're working with you know a mom and pop shop that you know it's like I have a number of homeowners associations. Their target market is the residents who live in their communities. They know who's coming to their site. Uh, another question: you, you mentioned in your presentation that Amazon limits your what your the CPU. Yeah. I've always thought it ramps up if you go above. If you're on their EC2 platform, it does. When you're on their light sale platform, it's metered, and they do have some burst capability, but it, it's metered on because it's more of a, it's not a shared platform because they're VPS, but it's a lower end platform that are for those smaller websites. Okay, good, good to know. Thank you. Because yeah. I'm a light sailor too, and I didn't know that. Thank you. I don't know. Do you have any advice for um, the process of your initial client communications? Like, do you do discovery calls? Do you write proposals? Is, are there ways that you can automate it? I, I have a quote unquote system. It's not automated, but it is. I will do an initial call with them. I do have a proposal template, so that way I'm able to just that really has my maintenance scope of work in it, has the majority of setup work, and then it's just adding maybe three or four bullet points. My proposal slash contract is a one pager, given that I do everything in month to month. And I, I will share, my, my setup fee is usually between, 19, uh, between $900 to $1,500. I'm going after that smaller clientele that they don't have the budget for a three to $5,000 website. Um, and so just through that process. Now, I will say one thing that I wish that I'd done early on that I didn't do was to set up a support ticket system. Since it's just me, myself, and I, I manage support through my, my Google email account. I use uh, Google Workspace. Um, but what I do is I label, all my, I have a lot of labels in Google, so that way I can find clients very easily. And I use my inbox, and I try to do the concept of inbox zero, and use my inbox as my support ticket and to-do list system. One of the things that I wish I would have done very early on is to say, okay, if you need, you know, if it's a sales question sort of thing, send it to me directly. If it's support related, send it to support for so I can track it there. 
but I never did that. And it was all, it was like, well, wait, Philip, we're emailing, we're emailing you. Why, why use multiple systems? And every time that I've explored some of the ticketing systems that are out there and spent about a month with any of them, it's more work and more, it makes me less productive because I'm having to bounce between multiple systems to manage it. So, was there a question in the back? Yeah. I'm going to answer this. Do you do price increases? I, so for new clients, yes, I will do price increases. Many of my clients have been with me for 10, 15, 20 years, and some of those are still at the $25 a month. I Usually what I try to do is once every five years or so, I do try to bump those older clients up to try to get them more. So the $25 went to $30, then from there I went to $40. Um, now, when you look at a percentage increase, that for some of those, that's a huge percentage. But then I say to them, look, I've had you at this price point for 10 years, for 15 years. I have had certain costs of increase. I really do need to increase. And quite frankly, I had one client that left me when I did that. And two or three years later, they came back. If they were going to leave me over five, $5, they were going to leave me for some other reason anyway. So it was one of those things I really didn't lose sleep over it. So. Any other questions? Yes. How often do you make To my own website, I I do that maybe once every two to three years. I do a redesign on my own website. In terms of running all the uh, updates of plugins and themes, that I do pretty much daily. But one of the things that I do is when I see that there's a plugin that, depending on what the plugin is, like Woo um, and a few of the other ones out there. If I know that that plugin typically has a, an update after the update, I'll wait a day or two just to make sure that it, I'm not seeing that extra plugin update come out, and then I'll run it for them. So. Kind of jumping off that, you just mentioned Boo. Is that what you're using for payments for clients? How are they paying you? Are they paying you through your site? Is there a I, all of my payments for that, I actually do directly through QuickBooks and QuickBooks Merchant Services because it's all integrated. They can pay by check or by credit card, and it just, I get the money in my bank, it does all the um, inputs for the receivables, and it just, again, it saves me time. I've seen some folks use invoicing systems, but that they're then not tied back to their accounting systems, and so there's a lot of integration where having everything right in through my accounting system saves me time and energy. So, yeah. You said that um, if all of the, your, with plugins and stuff with your sites, you would do it all at one time. Like you do all 450 plus sites at one time. Mm -hmm. How, you know, maybe I missed that. How do you do that? Because for me, you still want to do each plugin one, just to make sure nothing breaks. Right. So it, it, in Manage WP, I, I just click, you know, I, I see all the sites and I'll just click off one plugin and it'll tell me that it's available for 300 of the 450. At, and, and, and that I just click and let it run. And again, I there have been times where I say update everything because I know what, there's only th two or three plugins. I know what they are. I know they're not going to break. But there are other times where if I have 30 plugins that need to get updated across all the sites, I will click update 30 times because I let it run. I give it a little bit. I just make sure I don't get any site down notifications or any of the fatal error notifications. And I'm good. There is one site where I had an issue where site wasn't down, but functionality broke. It was an integration between um, the events calendar and WooCommerce and some checkout functionality. And we we caught it within an hour. It was they, they happened to have been on the site. Somebody tried it, and it's not a high volume site, but we caught it. And all I did was I rolled it back. It was a bug in the plugin. But that one site, I now have a note to say, okay, I'm going to you know, after I run the update, I go and I check that site. For the most part, those are the exceptions, not the rule. So. What, what services do you do in your My monthly hosting and, oh. Oh, my, my, so that is, I um, do the layout and design of the site and I use themes. I use WP Astra as my main theme and this also helps the process from the perspective of, I give them the demo site of that we're gonna use, and I say, okay, 
Look at what content is in this demo site. Replace the lorem ipsum with your content and it gives them exact homework of what to do and I get away from that white sheet blank stare. Um, so it's the, the setup of the site, the installation of WordPress, initial training if they're gonna be doing that, um, loading in all their content. I, in essence, do a, I say, give me what you want on the site. I'm gonna put it all in. Once we have it in, if you need to be trained, I'll train you, but that way you're not trying to learn from a blank slate. Oh. Uh, so the the monthly fee includes I take care of the hosting, I take care of um, email as I mentioned. I usually give between uh, three to five email accounts depending on how big their company is. I take care of the plugin updates. I take care of the content updates. The only time that I've really had any additional fees is where if somebody said, okay, well, hey, I want to install BB Press and set up a bulletin board on my site. And it's like, look, we didn't do that as part of the initial setup. That there's going to be a fee for because there's a lot of configuration. Or if we were going to add WooCommerce on down the line where we got a lot of setup and configuration, that I might have an additional fee. But I talk with them and I give them a scope of work and price it out as a project so it's not that the hourly clock starts running. I, and that way, it's very transparent to everyone. So again, jumping off the question, uh, <laughs> you're using uh, Astor, um, and Astor has a bunch of different um, designs that yep. are available or style things. It, do you typically offer one design to your client, and then I guess what I'm getting at is we all know about scope creep. Yeah. Uh, what what I will right in, in terms of how I work with that of using a template is what I will actually do, based on the discussion with the client and what they're looking for, I will find the two or three templates, content packs that I know would work for them. And I'll say, take a look at these, please pick one of these, and that's the one that will, so I'm trying to avoid that, oh, oh my goodness, I'm looking at 500 different designs, which one is gonna be white? So that, that's the way that I avoid the, Correct, correct. So, any other questions? Yes? And also on your uh, whole pack, on your hosting site, do you also provide like staging and all those included? So the, the server gives me the ability, I can host, it's a VPS server, so I, and it's running Plesk as the management, so I can always spin up on that same server a staging site when needed. Most of the changes that I'm making for these clients, I don't need a staging site, I might create a second, page on the site. For the ones that I do, I just, in Plesk, you say copy site, I throw a temporary domain on it, and we do it from that perspective, um, and makes life very easy. Yeah, of course, it's like for um, small uh, shops or small businesses, it's like not me. Yeah, yeah um, out of all my clients, I think maybe five at most are e-commerce sites, so those I really try to focus, and those I have my own processes for just, but since they're not in the main system of everything else, and I really focus on those special, and those are those one-offs, so. Yes, and I know we're just about out of time here, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you host your, what, what you? Um, I use GoDaddy for my registrar. All, I, and I will say, I also, I paid a little bit extra for the Domain Discount Club, because when, in GoDaddy has a product, for those that don't know, something called Domain Discount Club. It, the break-even point is, some, and they actually have two different levels. The first level is, I want to say, at the break-even is if you have about 25 domains, and the second level is if I think you have 75 domains. And they, they tell you on the site, but like I pay, I want to say, I believe it's about $120 a year, but instead of paying $15 per domain or whatever the standard price is for .com, it is, um, I pay $8 and change with the ICANN fees. So when you have, I have a probably 150 to 200 domains in my account because I manage for all the clients, I get a much better pricing. Now I charge them, my clients, the retail price and they're fine with that. They're, the difference is also I'm managing their DNS and everything else for them. So that's part of my revenue stream as well. So.
So the other advantage to that is you also get their premium DNS service when you're in that. So it, it's it supposedly, from what I recall, the marketing material is, for example, you I think it allows you to have up to 100 zone records versus I think the, the main one has like a cap of 20 or something. It, it, Go on the GoDaddy website, look, Domain Discount Club, it spells it out all in the marketing. So again, um, I have my uh, Twitter X handle, uh, email address if you'd like to reach out for anything. Um, if you want the slides or anything, just let me know. So with the domains, are all the domains going to be on you? Yeah, they're in my account, but when I do all the registration information, I'm the technical billing contact, the client is the client is the contact now in this day and age when all domains have privacy nobody really sees that anyway but i still put it in there because it's important from a legal perspective that if they ever want to if whatever reason they need to try to get something i want to make sure it's in their name so thank you